Hi there, and welcome from Ventura, California, to today's webinar, Automotive Grade GNSS Plus Inertial for Robust Navigation, sponsored by Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they demonstrate inertial-centric, GNSS-centric, and inertial-only implementations that go where only higher-cost platforms could venture before. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Experts panel session with all three of our panelists. Now, we've invited you, along with over 325 professionals from across 45 countries, representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce our main moderator for today's webinar, Alan Cameron, Editor-in-Chief of Inside GNSS Magazine and PNT Editor for Inside Unmanned Systems Magazine. He has covered the GPS, GNSS, PNT, and UAS, UAV industries and research communities as a writer and magazine editor since 2000, focusing on technical issues around the continuous, reliable positioning and navigation. So over to you, Alan. Thank you, Lori. Hello, everyone around the world, and welcome to the webinar. Welcome on behalf of Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems, and welcome also on behalf of webinar sponsor QNAV, and a thank you to QNAV. Uh, uh, Lori said that we have uh, registrants from 45 countries around the world, and I see by reviewing the panel of attendees that it looks like we do indeed have uh, wide international participation. That's great because this is a, a topic of, uh, of global relevance. Uh, first, before we get started with our panel, I'd like to introduce uh, Anant Fadlamani to say a few words on behalf of QNAV. Anant holds a PhD and is a systems engineer at QNAV. He leads embedded software architecture and implementation of multi-sensor navigation algorithms. Before joining QNAV, he worked in the field of navigation systems and location technology at various companies and held roles ranging from software development to driving customer adoption. Anant? Thank you for that introduction, Alan. And welcome everyone to this webinar on Automotive Grade GNSS Plus Inertial for Robust Navigation, sponsored by QNAV in association with our magazine partners Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems. At QNAV, our focus is robust, ubiquitous navigation in GNSS-denied and GNSS-challenged environments. We offer software solutions that augment GNSS for challenging applications. And one such is a sensor fusion technique for vehicular applications, which we are very excited to present in today's webinar. I'd like to thank all our attendees for taking the time for this webinar and I extend my thanks to our panel of experts who have so graciously agreed to share the latest developments on vehicular navigation. And thanks to our production team at WebAttract for putting together this excellent webinar. We have a lot of interesting concepts to present to you today, and I hope that you will find them as informative as we are excited to present them. And with that, over to you, Alan. Thank you, Anand. Uh, we're going to be hearing uh, in very short order from Andrei Soloviev at QNAV. Andrei is going to talk about uh, QNAV's GNSS inertial vehicular engine. Uh, followed by Philip Matos at UBLOX, who's going to talk about GNSS and inertial fused for accuracy and robustness. And rounding out the panel, UC Colin from Nordic Inertial, who's going to be talking about wheel-mounted inertial navigation. We're bringing you three different perspectives, all focusing on the same topic. Before we get underway, you, you've had a brief look at our panel. Let's get a brief look at you, the audience, with this poll question, Lori. Absolutely. Coming up on your screen should be that first uh, poll question. And if you wouldn't mind selecting one of the responses, the question is, what are your accuracy requirements for harsh environments, urban canyons, tunnels, parking garages? Uh, you can see choices there, 10 centimeters, 1 meter, 5 to 10 meters, greater than 10 meters. 
Okay, looks like uh, 51% saying 10 centimeters, 39, 1 meter, 9%, 5 to 10 meters, and 1% uh, of our audience saying greater than 10 meters. So um, any thoughts on those responses, Alan? Well, this is uh, more or less as expected. Uh, the requirements for automotive navigation are getting increasingly stringent down to the 10 centimeter area. Uh, there's a there's a healthy portion of the market that uh, finds that one meter is sufficient, and and this is uh, primarily I think in the in the uh, tracking mode, uh, and the others following in uh, to a lesser degree. Uh, let's hear first from our uh, first panelist, uh, who is Andre Soloviev, principal at QNAV. Andre holds a PhD. His research and development interests focus on sensor fusion and signal processing implementations for GNSS degraded and GNSS denied applications. He is a recipient of the Institute of Navigation's Early Achievement Award and the RTCA William Jackson Award. Andre, give us your give, that is your GNSS inertial vehicular engine. Well, thank you, Alan, and welcome, everyone. So I'm going to be setting up the stage for the technical discussion today, and we'll discuss what can be achieved by integrating GNSS with very low-cost inertial sensors in a standalone form factor solution type of mechanization, where we don't involve other sensors from the car. It's really GNSS inertial only, and what can be achieved with this kind of technology. So um, over the next few years, the performance of a low quality inertial sensors has been improved quite substantially to the point where such really low cost and low grade inertial sensors can be used in a very meaningful way for navigation applications. So we're looking at a standalone unit here without connecting to sensors within the car and applications, aftermarket applications such as vehicular tracking in GNSS challenged environments. We're really talking about very difficult scenarios here, such as urban canyons, tunnels, and parking garages. And so again, it's a self-contained solution, software-based solution for ease of operation. Uh, integration of consumer-grade GNSS with consumer-grade MEMS. The way we define consumer-grade MEMS inertial sensors, those are inertial sensors within the $2, $3 price range. It's a self-contained solution. We do not require connectivity to odometer and wheel speed sensors, um, maybe potentially other sensors in the car, such as vision, we're not looking at that. We're really trying to see what can be squeezed out of the GPS inertial only for ease of operation and obviously the cost of operation as well. Uh, the solution, what I'm discussing, yes, it's been validated and tested for specific sensors, specific set of sensors, but it's sensor agnostic. We're not really relying on a very specific Genesis chipset and we're not relying on a specific inertial chipset as well. And there are two sets of test results I'll be showing today with different sets of sensors that we used. So uh, it's a tight coupling of carry phase GNSS with inertial measurements. What we also exploit in quite a bit for improved performance is a vehicular motion model. And I'll talk about some details later on in a, on the next slide uh, or two. It's a software-based mitigation of multipath, so we don't go into the receiver and modify the receiver tracking capabilities, but we apply specific measures at the measurement screening level to mitigate the influence of multipath on the overall navigation performance, which is pretty significant for uh, specifically when we're talking about urban, urban canyon type of environments, and I'll show you some examples as we go through uh, the presentation. And the goal is reliable and consistent navigation performance with position, velocity, and attitude in a very difficult GNSS type of environment. Again, looking at urban canyons, tunnels, and parking garages. So at a high level, uh, what does the navigation mechanization look like? It's an INS-centric solution where inertial is a core sensor, provides navigation outputs at any environment, any time. But as Probably all of you know, especially when we talk about low-grade, consumer-grade type of inertial, it's going to drift pretty quickly uh, if we don't update it. So we use uh, aging data from GNSS receiver and vehicular motion model where it, where it exploits zero-velocity updates 
and was generally referred to as non-colonomic motion constraints. Um, you know, in the kind of like a simple language, what it means is that we, the car doesn't go to the side, it doesn't go up and down. And the carry phase from Genesis is a pretty instrumental to get the precision out of the Genesis inertial uh, fusion. And I'll talk a little bit into details uh, in, in a few seconds. How do we use in the carry phase? So uh, Genesis and inertial, they do provide aiding data. Well, Genesis and uh, motion model, they do provide aiding data for the inertial, but it's also what's important here is that the inertial provides the measurements for the outlier detection and mitigation on the genesis side and the vehicle motion side, specifically to detect and mitigate the multipath errors. Uh, so how do we use the carrier phase? Uh, there's an ambiguity term in, in the carrier phase, and before we calibrate it and use it for fusion with inertial data, we need to do something about it. Potentially, you can resolve the ambiguity and go into the RTK type of solution, but it's pretty challenging in urban environments to resolve the ambiguity uh, because there's a limited number of satellites, but also I am talking about a standalone type of solution, and you do need correction services, generally speaking, to resolve integer ambiguities. So instead of doing it, we apply this relatively simple trick. You basically difference carry phase measurements over time. And that gives you that, obviously, integer ambiguity is a constant term. It disappears during the difference in procedure. Uh, and what you get is the difference, uh, time difference range between the satellite and the receiver. It sort of makes the observable, this carry phase difference, not sensitive to absolute position states. But for integration with inertial and figuring out the INS error model, it's okay because uh, the, uh, the delta range is related to position change, and INS is a dead reckoning system by nature, you can figure out pretty much all, your, all, all of your error states from this change in the position. And the carry phase is super accurate, sub-centimeter, so we're getting this sub-centimeter accurate measurements without the need to resolve the ambiguities and calibrate the INS in a pretty quick and efficient fashion this way. So as I mentioned previously, multipath can be a really big problem, especially in urban environments. Uh, in deep urban canyons, that's, that's a pretty critical. What do we do to make sure that the measurements that are corrupted by the multipath are not included into the overall sensor fusion solution? So there are two steps that can be applied. And first one is relatively standard. Uh, it's like a fancy term for it, INS-based statistical gating. But essentially what it does, you predict what the measurement should look like based on the inertial, and then you compare what you actually see with what you predicted. And if the differences are large, then you just don't use that measurement. It's better not to use it because it's going to hurt you quite a bit if you do use a corrupted measurement. However, in challenging environments such as, you know, you go through the tunnel and then you get out into the urban canyon, your inertial is going to drift even if you integrate it with the motion model. And that window of the statistical gating, that uncertainty window that you apply, is getting larger and larger. So there may be still some multipath current measurements that you will accept based on the INS-based predict prediction measurement type of screening. And if you accept those measurements, they can still hurt you pretty badly. So we apply a second step, uh, which adaptively deweights the measurements based on their innovation values or based on the difference between the predicted and measurement, predicted and measured values. And that seems to be quite helpful in some very challenging scenarios. And I'll give show you an example of you know specific test case where it was actually extremely helpful to enable a reliable and robust performance. So some test results I'm going to be showing today. They were uh, produced with our GIF evaluation kit, which incorporates the U-Blocks MAT receiver. ST micro INEMO consumer grade INU, and the sensor fusion solution runs on an ARM processor on this board that I'm showing on the slide here. And the board is designed as a our sensor fusion uh, development platform. It is comparable uh, with other navigation sensors such as LiDAR and Vision. But again, today we're focusing on the Genesis inertial solution only in the self contained mode without connecting to other sensors. So the GIF was tested in a variety of test environments. So I'm showing some pictures from the actual test sites that, that, that we considered. Uh, the first one is Atlanta, Georgia. It's, it's 
pretty challenging urban environment, but not the most challenging one. The typical U.S. downtown. Uh, there was a test in Chicago, and this one gets really interested with some underground tunnels going through the city. Uh, the San Francisco financial districts, pretty dense urban canyons there, and underground parking garages as well. So here's an example of the real-time performances in pretty harsh GNSS environment in an underground parking garage. So we're making, getting into the garage here and making two loops there. Uh, we have a complete Genesis outage. There's no Genesis available at all for five minutes. And we got in, got out, stayed there for five minutes, then got out and made another, uh, another test, um, another run with a five-minute complete Genesis outage. So it's inertial-only performance here inside the parking garage, coupled with the motion model that enables you to navigate consistently over a very long Genesis outage. So on one hand, it's a pretty challenging test case, but on the other hand, from the measurement acceptance robustness point of view, it's sort of a simple one. You either have Genesis or you don't. So you don't really deal with corrupted measurement cases as compared to urban deep deep urban canyons environments where that's a substantial problem. So and that's what I'm going to be discussing next, results in actual urban canyons. Downtown Atlanta, again, not the most challenging environment, but still pretty challenging, especially for consumer-grade type of solutions. So um, this plot here on the left shows the zooms on the trajectory in downtown Atlanta. Basically, the solution stays on the road, pretty consistent navigation performance over the entire duration of the test. And the plot on the right, uh, this is similar to the previous slide that I've showed, getting in and out of the parking garage uh, under a complete Genesis outage and enabling uh, consistent and robust navigation performance for this portion of the test as well. So Chicago is very difficult and very interesting environment in terms of the Genesis challenges. So example of the test trajectory here in downtown Chicago and zooming on specific part of it, showing you a photograph here, what it looks like. So essentially you're driving un under the elevated rail in an urban canyon. So you have a pretty severe multipath conditions here. So that ability to screen the measurements and select which ones you want to use and which ones you don't becomes extremely, extremely critical here. Because if you do accept the bad measurement and you tell your sensor fusion filter that it's good, divergence is almost guaranteed. So uh, for this specific case, again, uh, consistent navigation performance, no divergence issues, and we essentially keep the car on the road pretty much through the, through the entire duration of the test, including this very difficult portion here going under the rail in an urban canyon. Another example case now, uh, let's see what, how it works in the tunnel. So again, uh, this is the Chicago. Um, those of you may be familiar with the downtown Chicago, there's a low wacker drive that runs underneath the city, supposed to help with the traffic a little bit. So we enter the tunnel here, and then all this part of the trajectory over here, we basically stay in the tunnel. There's no Genesis. And then we get out here. So in the tunnel during this long duration, and Chicago traffic is pretty notorious. So how long you stay in the tunnel kind of depends on the um, time of the day when you're doing your experiments. I think in this specific case, it was probably five to seven minutes of a complete Genesis outage. And the solution, again, pretty consistent. Maybe not at the middle level, but for such a long Genesis outage, that's what you can do by combining Genesis with inertial in a vehicle motion model. Another example in downtown Chicago. Now, uh, let's stress the system even more. We are uh, getting into the tunnel here and out of the tunnel at this point, consistent performance in the tunnel. But when we get out of the tunnel, we actually get out into the urban canyon type of scenario, this one here. So it's really stressing this, this robustness of the measurement selection process for our sensor fusion filter. So this actual picture is uh, from, from Google Earth. This is right before the exit and right after the exit. So you're exiting from the tunnel into the urban canyon. So if we don't apply this second step of the measurement screening process, it doesn't work quite well here. But if we do this additional de-weighting procedure, 
It helps us to enable seamless transition from a tunnel into an urban canyon and maintain a pretty consistent navigation capabilities throughout the entire test trajectory. Another test example, a financial district in the downtown San Francisco. Pretty similar performance uh, at the higher level with consistent navigation in dense urban canyons and being able to keep the car within a lane for most of the test. So I mentioned previously, the solution that we developed is a software-based solution that does not rely on specific set of sensors. So we did test that. So essentially we can work with any sensors, low cost genesis and inertial sensors. What's important from the genesis side is that we do have access to raw measurements, uh, pseudo ranges and specifically carry phase because that's instrumental for the precision of the inertial calibration. So we tested that part uh, and validated the functionality of, of the GIF software using sensor data that we logged from a Xiaomi Mi 8 cell phone. So this is on the left here, uh, and, and th this is a, a Chicago test as well with the tunnel drive, the low wire drive. So uh, on the left here with the red trajectory, this is the position solution recorded from the phone itself, just the Genesis only. And it works fairly well, uh, even through the urban canyon, it's, it works fairly well. But once you get into the tunnel, you can obviously see the limitations of the Genesis only approach. It just does not produce the position at all. When you compare it with a low-cost inertial and a vehicle motion model, you get a consistent navigation performance throughout the entire trajectory. So to conclude, with the current state of the art of low-cost genesis and inertial sensors, it's possible to enable a software-based solution that provides consistent and reliable navigation performance even in the most challenging automotive scenarios such as urban canyons, tunnels, and parking garages. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Alan. Thank you, Andre. Uh, we have some questions already coming in about your presentation, but we'll turn to those uh, at the midway point uh, of Philip's presentation. We'll hear now from Philip Matos. Philip has a PhD, and he is a positioning technology expert for Ublox with degrees in electrical engineering from Cambridge and Bristol. He's a deep technical expert in GNSS, personally having designed hardware and software for GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, and Beidou systems. He served on Galileo advisory groups in Brussels for the European Commission, was a visiting research fellow at Bristol University, a visiting professor at University of Westminster, and previously worked as technical director and fellow applying GNSS knowledge to chipsets for sat navs, cars, asset tracking, and more for over 25 years. He was awarded the Royal Institute of Navigation Gold Medal for 2017. Philip, please give us your presentation on GNSS and inertial fused for accuracy and robustness. Thank you, Alan. So, for GNSS in the car, what we need is an accurate solution with continuous availability of that accuracy. To do that, we would like to have as many satellites as possible. We'd like them to include as many constellations. We want to get that accuracy both reliably and very, very soon after starting. The inertial, or other forms of dead reckoning, we have various combinations. We can do 2D ADR if we have a differential wheel tick. So that's a connection to the car that gives us the speed of two wheels. And by comparing those in mathematical way, we can detect the rotation of the car and that allows us to give a 2D ADR. We've got wheel ticks and a gyro. The gyro detects the turns in the absence of GNSS, and we can, again, do 2D, 2D ADR. But if we've got the gyro, which is an inertial MEMS device, accelerometers, which are a MEMS device, 
and the wheel tick, that allows us to do 3D ADR. So if we do that as a demonstration here, we're going into this parking garage, and this is entirely without GNSS inside the garage. It has long tracks up and down each floor. It has a spiral at the end where it's going up a floor or down a floor. So doing that one, we can continue and get the actual altitude all the time, the attitude of the, of the vehicle going up the slopes and so on. It, it's a definite improvement when we're in the DR mode. By DR mode, at this case, we mean with no GNSS reception. But what happens when we've got some but bad GNSS reception? This example is in, in a city when we have weak signals. And the comparison here is between the yellow plot, which is the inertial, with GNSS, we call UDR, so it has no connection to the vehicle to pick up the speed or distance, but it does have the inertial MEMS devices. The yellow one is what we can do when we may take, the, take advantage of that, those inertials, against the green, which is what we get with GNSS only. And then the white track, which is almost completely hidden, is the actual route. So there was a small offset at the beginning here, but by the time we get to here, they're completely overlapped and you don't see the white track again. And the benefit of this type of operation is that this is not something that you get with your car. It's something that's fitted in the aftermarket, a tracking device, an insurance payment device, or any of those. And it can be placed anywhere in the car. So, for example, by placing it on a parcel shelf under the driver's console, for example, it will generally have very bad signals. They'll be weak, and then they'll be reflected or blocked by the buildings that we show you here. So, this can be done where, where the environment, both very locally, i.e. in the car, and in the city, is poor. And we can together get a very good accuracy. So, the examples that we have of applications where this might occur are, for example, security, it's a car alarm, pay-as-you-drive insurance, the type of uh, navigation system that is completely aftermarket, so you might stick it to your windscreen with a, a suction device. We could have road tolling. So when they sold the car, they didn't know that it was going to be used for road tolling. There'd be some sort of tag that uh, did the tolling for you. It could be for onboard diagnostics. It could be for fleet managing, fleet management. And by using the, the inertial MEMS devices, the manufacturer of the system can get more for his overall device. He can get new markets because he gets much better performance, as we showed you with that uh, yellow and green plot earlier, and effectively he gets cost and size reduction. You saw the very small device that was being put on, under the dashboard. Because he has that extra performance already, he doesn't have to have a great big device that has much bigger GNSS functionality and hence cost, but we'll come to that when it's needed later. When we come to slightly more uh, technology, shall we say, for ADAS or for, for autonomy, we want to have a, a higher accuracy for lane accuracy. We want to stay within the lane, various levels of cruise control and automatic driving. So on the right here, we have the, the situation in an urban highway. So although it's an open highway, it's got intersections, bridges, signboards, that obstruct the signal or reflect the signal. There are other parts of the um, system that will be done, for example, here. This one would be done by radar or LIDAR and gives distance. We've got a nice open sky for the GNSS to know exactly where, where we are. These are the various levels. But finally, if we're going to give it completely, give control of the car completely over to some computer for 
totally autonomous purposes, then accuracy is not enough on its own. We also need to have the other benefits, other features of integrity. That is, it can report its confidence in its own accuracy. To an incredibly high degree, it must say, I am accurate to some particular protection level. And if it can't do that because of the very bad signal or similar, uh, it has to say, I'm unavailable, don't use me. And at that point, some other device has to take over. In the current levels of automation, it's the driver that takes over. In future totally autonomous devices, then it's simply a case of what classes of road it will be allowed to drive on. And then finally, if the actual computer or chips were to fail, there would be a serious problem. So for a completely autonomous uh, device, there's what we call functional safety. They have to be designed all the way through to make sure that if something goes wrong, it knows it's gone wrong and doesn't continue to claim to be operating correctly. Right, so now I'll hand it back to Alan for the questions. Thank you, Philip. We're going to pause. Uh, Philip will return in a few minutes to, to continue his presentation. But we're going to pause to uh, take a few questions and and ask a question, as you shall see shortly. But first, uh, Andre, we have a question uh, for you concerning your presentation. What are the requirements for the initial alignment of GIVE? Does the unit have to be oriented in a certain way relative to the car, and is there a need for turns? All right. Well, thank you, Alan, for that. that that's a great question. So basically, the unit does not have to be oriented in a certain specific way in a car, but it has to be fixed. So there are no requirements how it's, it can be oriented in whatever way the, the, the customer wants it but it needs to be fixed and cannot move around the car during the operation because of this motion constraint model that we apply. So that's number one. You need to make some turns so we can figure out your heading and the orientation of the unit relative to the car, but nothing extraordinary. Uh, it's generally just start driving, make a turn, stop and go, and the, the initial alignment is completed. Thanks, Andre. And another question for you. What's the typical stability of automotive grade inertial sensors? Okay, so this is a change in landscape. So um, I think the sensors keep on improving. The ones we're currently using in our give evaluation kit from ST Micro, based on the stability figures that we evaluated, uh, there's a ballpark number set probably about the 100 degrees per hour in terms of stability. The turn-on to turn-off biases for the gyros can be significantly larger, a few degrees per second. But those are relatively easy to calibrate when you initially start the car and you know you're stationary. You just use that period of time to maybe even a few seconds is sufficient to figure out your initial biases. And afterwards, stay stable again at about a 100 degree ballpark number uh, per hour type of stability. However, I know there are some new products coming from ST Micro, for example, that's uh, supposed to be significantly more stable. Uh, and we looked at those under, you know, uh, new, some new developments that we're doing. So they seem to be stable at, you know, at the 10 degree per hour uh, type of figures. And, you know, there's some units coming that, that are claiming even a degree per hour type of stability for consumer grade sensors. So I think it's improving more and more which, um, you know, you, you, you should get better and better performance out of uh, the integration techniques that we're discussing today. Again, Andre, uh, Philip showed, was talking about uh, connecting to the, the wheel sensor. One of the uh, audience uh, participants wants to know, is there any particular reason you do not want to connect to the CAN bus to obtain such uh, wheel odometry data or, or other? It, Right, it's it's a good question. It's for ease of operation for off to, off to market solutions. And Philip, I think, gave some great examples of the applications. And just you can you mount the unit wherever you want, and you don't have to impose the requirement on your customers to connect to the CAN bus. It just becomes cheaper and easier to use. And for 
tracking applications, it seems to be that you don't have to. But of course, you gain more performance if you connect to the odometer. All right, thank you. We'll return with uh, more questions for all three of our panelists uh, toward the latter part of the webinar. Right now, we have a, a question for you, the audience. Lori, uh, we'll take your answers for that and then have a bit of discussion and then return to Philip's uh, second half. Yes, poll two on the screen. Uh, in which problem scenarios are low-cost inertial solutions most useful? Typical urban environment, tree canopies, tunnels, and parking garages, multi-level interchanges. Uh, in this case, we're asking you on your honor system to give us your top two responses. Coming in with uh, 74% uh, typical urban environment, 24% uh, tree canopies, 60% tunnels and parking garages, and 28 multi-level interchanges. Um, Alan, any thoughts here? Taking into account the fact that uh, everybody could select two, thus we have a total of well over uh, 100%. Uh, obviously, uh, the typical urban environment and tunnels and parking garages are the leading categories of interest. And these are the ones that uh, pose the, the most challenges, definitely the most uh, common or frequent challenges to car navigation and the ones that really need to be solved first uh, in order to proceed further down the road to uh, ADAS systems and eventually autonomy. Uh, even now, they, they need to be uh, well resolved for, for tracking and, uh, and map navigation. Uh, but it does show that our panel is uh, our panel is speaking to the issues that the audience is attracted to. Uh, let's return now to the second half of Philip's presentation, uh, fusing GNSS and inertial. Philip, please go ahead. Thank you, Alan. So here we have the the sort of accuracies that we can achieve with the various types, shall we say, of integration. So with single band GNSS and dead reckoning, we're looking in the area between one and two meters. So with no corrections, we get about two meters. And here we're talking about the 50% mark of accuracy. Uh, so 50% of fixes will be within two meters. And down here, just, just worse than one meter, we've got S for S bus. So if we have the corrections that are broadcast by the, the WAS and the EGNOS satellites, then we can do just better than a meter. Then we can move up to having multiband uh, GNSS with dead reckoning, for example, L1 and L2 and L5. Similar set of applications at the bottom here, but We've made a slight improvement. We've come down from around the two meter to around the one and a half meters, and the a slight improvement to the the SBAS version at the bottom. And then we can go further. We can have multiband with the inertials with SSR RTK. So these are particularly uh, useful corrections, shall we say? SSR RTK is a version of RTK where the actual corrections can be broadcast. They're not, uh, they're not created specifically for each customer, each client. Uh, so they are suitable for widespread use. And again, with the same set of, of frequencies, we can get right down to what has previously been only available to surveying systems. So this one here is in the, the centimeter level occasionally and very often in the 10 centimeter, the decimeter, decimeter level. To do that, we are using multiple bands and our F9 processor works in two modes. You can have the option A set of frequencies, which was chronologically A and then B later. Chronologically A is better where the satellites are available for the last few years because there's a, a slight lack 
of L5 satellites here. The L5 satellites have a, a, a minimum set of GPS satellites, and it's only now the GPS3 satellites that are becoming available here. By using option A, we can use the, the E5B satellites, which are Galileo. In this band, we can use L2, we can use the GLONASS in there. So historically, option A would be the best. But looking forward, option B will come and we'll have both available. Traditionally, we've had very, very precise GNSS, we're calling this high precision GNSS, and this is of the surveying type, shall we say, incredibly precise. And at the other end, we have the standard applications, which are in the sort of three meter area down here. And what's emerging is a market that needs to be somewhere in between. So we need to be able to offer products for markets that want 10 centimeters, that want one meter to various levels of uh, percentage, but additionally, percent of availability percentage. So when we go into a, a more and more difficult environment, what percentage of the time can we still achieve our one meter? Can we still achieve our uh, 10 centimeters? So here's an example of going through a tunnel. Now, a tunnel is again a case where we go at some point from full GNSS to no GNSS. So it's entirely dead reckoning when we come through this tunnel. Green is the truth. So each spot was a fix. We were actually here. But in, in the consumer world, we wouldn't have known that. That's only because this is a test system. In the, the inertial, the dead reckoning world, we came down these blue dots, and we see that we come out of the tunnel, which was two kilometers long, it's in Gothenburg, in Sweden. Um, when we come out of the tunnel, this is the accumulated error of the dead reckoning system. Very, very small. And that is around 1% of the distance that we've traveled. And then within two seconds, we have spots here plotted every two seconds. Within two seconds, we're back up to the lane accuracy level that we require. But in fact, by eye, you can see that almost instantly, this first fix with any satellites is reasonably good. And this one's even better. And the final one with the blue solid dot, which says this is a fused solution, uh, we're truly back within spec. If we look across this from left to right, the Accuracies with and without correction services, with single band on the left, with multiband but no dead reckoning here, and then multiband with dead reckoning. And then as we move across within each class, we go from no corrections to SBAS corrections, that's WAS and EGNOS, and finally with a correction service equivalent to SSR RTK. And you see that this final one here is down at eight centimeters, which is just a little wonderful. We haven't said how bad these urban conditions are, but they're, because they've, it's got the dead reckoning, it doesn't degrade quite as rapidly. So even if the conditions are bad for a short time or a short distance, the actual position doesn't come, become any significant significantly away from the truth. So to conclude, we can get reliable positioning even in case of outage, that's the no GNSS signals being transmitted, or if they're blocked, or if there's jamming blocking them from us, or we have them distorted by reflections, etc. The UDR style does not require any connection to the vehicle. So it can be installed in any vehicle. It can be just magnetically attached or things like that for tracking purposes. As we move up the uh, quality spec, shall we say the, the um, amount of control that the computer has of the vehicle, then we start needing applications that use carrier phase and they have GNSS with SSR RTK. 
And then beyond that, when it's totally controlling the vehicle, it can't go directly back to the driver and say, your turn now. We need to have integrity, that is, the reported, this, the reported error must be safe, shall we say. So we'll give a protection level and say we guarantee that only once in a blue moon will the error be bigger than the error we're telling you. Remember, it's very easy, as in the green dots of the truth system on the tunnel exit we showed you, uh, it's very easy when you're testing it for development, but you don't actually know the truth when the car is, is in real use. So the GNSS system, the computer behind it, has to know that from the, the errors that are inside it. And that's called a protection level. And then finally, we have to have functional safety, which is the guarantee that it's not going to go wrong. That it's been designed in a way that any internal faults will be detected so that they can be handled safely. Thank you very much. Back to you, Alan. Thank you, Philip. We'll have more questions and answers from the full panel uh, after the next presentation. Uh, we'll hear now from UC Cullen. UC is the CEO of Nordic Inertial and adjunct professor at Tampere University. He received master's and doctorate of technology degrees from the Tampere University of Technology in Finland, specializing in inertial navigation algorithms. His research interests are in modern machine learning methods and their industrial applications in the field of inertial sensing. Yussi, please give us your presentation on wheel-mounted inertial navigation. Thanks, Alan. Good to be here. So, my, I'm going to talk about the case where we would like to stay at GPS level, but without any aiding. So, let's say that we, for some reason, we don't have odometry or wheel ticks, so we only have uh, inertial. We know that the inertial sensors provide observations everywhere. Wherever there's motion, you can feel it with the accelerometer, and when, wherever something turns, you can feel it with the angular rate sensor. But the challenge is, of course, as we know, that if we want to have pure inertial na navigation, then the things get really large, and they cost a lot, and they can be used only in ships or airplanes, for example. So what would we do if we want to have a vehicle with, let's say, lower cost solution, but aim still to have, let's say, one hour of inertial output. So within one hour, we might need to get update. So our solution is to add some constraints and do some little calibration for this kind of specific application. We know from the background that there's actually one such solution available, which is called foot-mounted inertial navigation. And what is done in there is that whenever the shoe hits the ground, we check from the filter that what is the velocity based on the filter, and we know it's zero, so we can backtrack those let that velocity component to the inertial errors. And every time we take a step, we hit the ground, velocity is zero, we get update, even though we don't have GNSS or, or odometer. So this is kind of stepwise inertial. And what we do, we extend this a little bit. So if you take a little bit, uh, check in the middle figure, let's add some shoes. And finally, on the right, let's have infinite amount of shoes. And actually, what you get then is a wheel. And when we measure the distance from the wheel hub to the uh, ground, which is the radius, uh, we can also do the similar thing. That if it doesn't have to be in the tire. We can, we can have the unit in the wheel hub and then have continuous updates. So every cycle of the common filter, let's say, we, we get the update that our velocity in that part is zero. So obviously, we know if we have a radius and we measure the angle with the inertial sensors, so we can limit, obviously, we can limit the limit distance growth. But also, what is happening is that when the unit is rotating, we get a effect, what it's called carouseling, which means that when the gyro biases go through this uh, rotating motion and we transform the frame to the vehicle, we will actually get the sinusoid of the wheel uh, of the gyro biases. And as you know, the 
over a full cycle, the sinusoid, sinusoid uh, integral is zero. So we get actually, we get reduced two things that are also distance, but also the heading drift. And then we can see something that is in, in this uh, figure that the free navigation grows to the time cubed and then the constraint is, is limited heavily. So this is error versus time. But does it really work? So of course we need to try. So in the left left image I will show this is real data, two kilohertz from uh, IMU that is attached to the to the wheel very large vehicle, so this is driving quite uh, slowly. Uh, large vehicle driving slowly. And in the yellow, you can see in the gyro plot, you can see actually that this one axis that is um, actually directly measuring the wheel angle rate. And then, but also you can see in the, in the other axis, you can see actually modulation, which happens when the car is actually turning, so the yaw is changing or the heading is changing. You can see this kind of a modulated signal in the raw data. But also in the accelerometer data, you can see the specific force and whenever the car or the wheel rotates, you can see amount of gravity modulated by the modulated in the raw signal. So we actually have two different methods to see how the well, independently we can see from two plots that the car is moving. And actually with our filter in the right side you can see that we can actually process this to the inertial navigation mechanization and get nice trajectory given that every cycle we update based on the angle information. And it's actually pretty accurate. In, in this slide I will show a little bit more to the gyro by IMU that is, uh, let's say, 10 degree per second bias, which is we don't see anymore that kind of biases, but just for an example. So in the left side, the car is turning, and on the right side, it's driving straight. And the blue one is the raw data. But when we transform this to the vehicle frame, which means that it's the frame where the passenger sits or fixed to the vehicle chassis, we can see that this is actually the bias will be modulated. So if you integrate this, you will get a little wobble on the heading, but the error doesn't ac uh, accumulate like it would if you integrate the blue signal. What we really do, we don't do this because it's uh, inertial navigation mechanization is quite complex and nonlinear. So we want to get rid of the bias right away. We want to estimate it and remove it from the equations before they enter the mechanization, but that can that can actually be done. But so this is just an example what would happen with one gyro rotating around the wheel. And here's one real example. So we go underground, we start everything underground. So we don't see GPS signals at all. We put the unit to the rear wheel of the passenger car and start driving. And on the right side, you can see actually what is given real time we upload to, to the tablet. And that is around 20 minutes. And we can actually see which side of the car the wheel was. So we have to remember we don't have any, to, we don't fuse with anything. So we don't have lever arm. We output just everything based on that part of the car, which is in this case left wheel. And if we think about the accuracy, in the pole there was 10 centimeters, one meter, maybe not there yet, but in, in this case we were within one meter when we ended the, ended the test. But meanwhile, due to the scale factor, it was a little bit more. So this kind of, uh, we, we say that we stay at 10 meters and the aim is like standalone GPS, one hour is the kind of aim, but we aim with this system. But eventually we need some updates. So even let's say we drive one hour or some automatic system that drives one hour, eventually even this will drift. So what we do, we convert this output from the wheel because the systems nowadays don't understand what is coming out of the wheel. So we can convert it to wheel ticks and your rate. Or actually what we can do is to transform everything to the traditional inner soul measurement just change the coordinate frame from the wheel to the car 
And then we have specific force and angular rate that looks like it would be measured in the car, but it actually is taken from the wheel, which means that it's more precise. And thus it, it is, it's quite interesting to fuse with the third-party software because it seems to work. So the third-party software takes care of the GPS fusion. And actually the result in this picture is, is taken such way that we are cheating the system to think that it's pure inner or it's just a IMU. And we have tried also this uh, robot operating system tools because there are lots of uh, there's lots of filters available in in that toolboxes and they seem to work fine, even though we don't tell that this was measured from the different place this inertial data. This is a bad thing about this is of course that we need to put things to the wheel and it's a little bit hostile place. For example, in the mines, underground, lots of dust. So we have thought lots of kind of covering the units and uh, so far it seems that this kind of rubber unit tolerates very well the environment. The vibration in the inertial sense, it's not, it's not really a big problem. The sensors tolerate it and integrate the vibration out but all kind of other things that does it tolerate the rocks and so on, they seem to be a bigger problem. We are also making an extended battery version, which means that it stays alive for, let's say, 40 days. We have to keep the gyros on all the time, so it's not like a pressure sensing unit in the wheel that only wakes up every minute. We have to collect the gyro data all the time, and the gyros have moving elements, so it takes a little bit power, but we also make sleep ring version. So if somebody wants to build a robot from the scratch, he might want to put the wires in and then send the signals and the power through the sleep ring. And what we see in the future is we started from the wheel, but we can use the same method for the robot manipulators or excavator arms. We can use similar way to predict where the part of the inner soul unit is, and predict its motion and give feedback again to the filter. And it seems by initial test that we will be really accurate on this. So we know both how the vehicle is moving, but we also know where it's pointing or where it's picking up something. So this is really, that looks really promising to extend this, uh, what inner soul was doing before, now it's extended to the robots and excavators and such. And to conclude, like in all the presentations, I think it, everyone is using some kind of constraint that we know that double integrating the accelerator after leveling, we, we don't get much, but if we add constraints based on how the vehicle moves, we, we, get really, we can really reduce the cost and size of the units, and then we can have more applications for inertial that wasn't there before. And food-mounted inertial is a great example, but now, now it seems that we are continuing to other areas as well, wherever we know something about the, how the vehicle is moving, and we can get position and heading drift reduced, but for this heading drift, what is needed, the motion has to change in the pitch and roll, because if the only heading changes, we don't see enough to actually see what is causing the error. So that's something why the wheel is good place, because there's so much pitch dynamics that we can see almost all the errors that are happening in the in the accelerometers and gyros. So this was my presentation, so back to you, Alan. Thank you, Yussi. We have a couple of questions coming in for you, as well as questions for both Philip and Andre. But first, another question for the audience. Lori, there's the poll, and audience, uh, there's your question. Uh, please give us your answers. Yes, on the screen you should see the question, in what platforms are low-cost inertial solutions best suited? And again, uh, we're asking you on the Honor System to go ahead and give us your top two selections among car, machine control, tractors, and heavy machinery, 
drone UAS, pedestrian, or truck. So we came in with 71% uh, saying car, 29 machine uh, control tractors and heavy machinery, 45% um, drone UAS, 36% saying pedestrian, and 23% truck. Um, Alan, any thoughts here? Well, the, the core of the question, obviously, is the low-cost, uh, low-cost inertial solutions. And the uh, three-quarters of our audience uh, is, is opting for car, which seems, uh, seems reasonable. And uh, then a uh, little under half for drone UAS. Um, not sure personally if low cost really suits. It, I guess it depends on the application. It depends entirely on the application and the environment. Uh, then we see others. Uh, pedestrian, of course. Uh, I've seen uh, less less about pedestrian navigation over the last couple of years than I saw uh, in terms of research papers being published than I saw prior to that. But it's still a very active field and a and uh, a very vital one. But uh, appropriately enough, uh, our audience seems to be primarily interested in and finding relevance in the automotive field. We'll return to our panel uh, with some questions. First, I'm going to go back to UC and ask uh, what happens if the wheels slip? Yes, that's a good question. So what we do in the filter, we predict and then if the wheel slip actually we misunderstand the velocity we actually can see it, that something is wrong but there's not much we can do it we can say for the later or follow-up system or the integrating filter that there's something wrong but we cannot yet really measure the slip so we don't lose the heading but we will lose some parts during the slip we lose the distance and another question for you, you see, could the energy from the IM for, for the IMU rather, could the energy for the IMU be harvested from the wheel motion? Uh, yes, we would like to do that. But like I said, we have gyros drawing quite a lot of power, so it's, it would be some kind of mechanical or induction system. It's, uh, we are, eventually we will get there, but not, not at the moment. I'm going to turn to Philip now with a question about your presentation, Philip. What is the benefit of inertial if we already have the accuracy of SSR RTK? Thank you, Alan. Well, the accuracy is either in a benign situation, open sky, etc., or it's a percentage of the time, meaning we're in the open sky for some percentage and we've got difficulties some percentage. If we've got the inertial, it allows us to make the average a lot better because it improves the, uh, the accuracy. But most importantly, it's a matter of, t of time. The, the most accurate version, the SSR RTK down in the centimeter decimeter level, relies on the fact that we've resolved the number of integer cycles, the, the, the ambiguity now, to do that takes some degree of time, and it's also a good idea not to lose it afterwards. And in order to, uh, to do it in a sensible length of time, when we pass under a bridge or anything like that, we want to know almost precisely where we are when we next get the signal. So it, it, it's the fact that we are able to give the very accurate position for a much bigger percentage of the time because we recover so quickly. Can I add to this, Alan? Please do. Yeah, obviously, uh, and also the, the obvious answer is also if you're interested in the orientation, the attitude, the inertial is quite helpful there as well. Uh, if you need to, not just the position and velocity from GNSS, but also pitch roll and your for some of the tracking applications, for example, it's, it's important to have those. All right, thanks, Andre. A question for you now, Andre, about your tests, the, the Mublox F8 and M8 tests. Were those tests uh, conducted with GNSS quality antennas or consumer-grade antennas? 
They were conducted with pretty cheap antennas. So basically patch antennas with magnetic mount mounted on top of the car. But nothing, you know, survey quality or I'm not sure what Genesis quality means. Uh, but, you know, like nothing really extravagant on the antenna side. Pretty cheap, low quality antennas. All right. And uh, another question for you, Andre. How accurate does the motion model have to be? And what are the effects of inaccuracies that exceed expectations in the model? So I'll probably elaborate on it a little bit. So there are two types of motion constraints, the motion model that we apply. And one is detecting ze uh, basically stops and applying zero velocity constraints and recalibrating the, gyro the gyros as well during those stops. So, um, you know, when, you, when you're when not moving, you're not moving. And that's that's very accurate. The the trick is uh, when you sort of in a traffic situation and you moving really slow in the stop and go. If your algorithm thinks you stopped but you actually didn't, that can hurt your solution quite substantially. So that part is pretty critical. And so we really try to define and develop very robust algorithms how you determine that you actually stopped. Uh, which is also independent of different different vehicles, different car models. So that 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 part is 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 quite important. So the uh, the zero stops, uh, the the zero velocity updates and stops. Uh, the second part of a motion constraint model is uh, non holonomic velocity constraints, essentially saying that car doesn't go down relative, not in the absolute sense, but relative to the road, it doesn't move up and down. And that's unless you, you know, in an interesting situation where you're in an accident or something, it, that constraint is, is, is always valid. Uh, and then another constraint is that it doesn't go to the side, like a cross-lateral constraint. Uh, it's, sometimes it's not valid when you go into the turn and your unit is quite a bit displaced as compared to the center of gravity. And there you have to be careful. This this outlier detection mitigation scheme that we apply, we're actually screening and making sure the the constraints that we apply there they actually they're acceptable at the at this point of time. So it's not maybe like overall not really the matter of the accuracy, but of the validity of your model in in certain specific times. But again, uh, it does not require the car to do anything specific or any particular type of motion, uh, you just drive normally and the algorithm figures out what it can use and what cannot be used. So that, that was my answer. All right. Thank you, Andre. Uh, a question to Philip. What about precise point positioning, PPP? How does that help improve the accuracy within the sensor and dead reckoning? Okay. It depends to a large degree what we mean by PPP. For example, the very accurate versions used now were sometimes called PPPRTK. It depends what corrections we're going to need for that precise point positioning. Normally, PPP, old-style PPP, takes a very, very long time to get an initial position. And because of that, it's really not acceptable. When I'm talking about long time, I mean minutes because it, it essentially needs to wait for the satellites to move before it can work out uh, the integer ambiguity. But PPPRTK, which is a name used, is how one could do, could do that. One can resolve the int integer ambiguity, but one has c corrections that help you do it. The, the term SSR, which was the term I used in our F9 RTK uh, accuracies, SSR doesn't mean that it's not PPPRTK. What it means is that the method by which that transmit that those corrections are transmitted is independent of the user. So you can transmit the corrections and the user can then work out what the corrections should be for his current location, as opposed to having to tell the server your location and get back the corrections, which is a two-way system. So if you put a million users on it, they're going to need a million links to the server with traffic. Without uh, having expansion from the, uh, the questioner as to what he wants to improve, 
certainly it it helps time wise and the old fashioned ppp is really not very suitable for moving vehicles thank you thanks philip you see a question for you now how is the variating wheel radius managed in the filter of the navigation system in in our own bootstrap filter there's not much we can do. We accept it and show a little bit longer or shorter distance. But if we fuse the output to the other system like GPS, in typical third-party filter, there is actually some kind of uncertainty put to the tire pressure, for example. So then the GPS updates will, will fix that. All right, and one more qu quick question for you, UC. Can the wheel-mounted sensor be installed by car manufacturers or equipment manufacturers? Yes, they could. So we have tire pressure sensors already in the cars. Only limiting thing now is the power. So once we get the power there, for sure, it can be in the all vehicles. All right. Andre, question for you. What... Position and heading accuracy did you get inside the parking garage? All right, so the, the heading part is probably easier to answer uh, because the heading accuracy didn't really degrade over the five, ten minute dust durations that we've done. And it stayed at the level of one, two degrees. It really depends how accurately you can align the heading when the GNSS is available. And then it doesn't drift all that much because... Uh, the gyros are fairly stable. Uh, position, uh, obviously better when you just get into the parking garage versus when you get out. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the end of the test where we were experiencing pretty low on Genesis outage, it was at the level of 5, 10 meter position errors accumulated over the test duration. And another question for you, Andre. How often did you stop for the zero velocity updates and how long were the stops? Right, so uh, we didn't do anything on purpose. So uh, really, it depends on the traffic situation. So it's different, you know, Atlanta versus downtown San Francisco, you stop a lot and for a long period, a longer period of time. Um, so it, we, again, we didn't, we didn't stop on purpose to improve our system. You just if you happen to stop, you stop, and the algorithm takes advantage of it. And how long you stop also depends on uh, the traffic around you. Uh, the algorithm, if, if you stop for uh, a two seconds, or one, one to two seconds, then basically we'll take, we'll take advantage of it. If it's less than that, then we'll, we probably won't. It's too unreliable at this point to to tell the system that, that, that we stopped. All right, thank you. Uh, Philip, one more question for you uh, about dual bands. What are the benefits of dual band? Well, again, the, the issue is how fast can we do things? And fundamentally, um, the, the, the RTK system is, is almost always um, done dual band if we want to go down below a meter and we want to have uh, a reasonably rapid time to get there we really need to have the, the dual band facility it allows us to resolve the integer ambiguities by looking at both the um, both the signals because their delay through the ionosphere is different because they're on different frequencies but it's it's known how different it is so we can make calculations that will tell us how much the very local ionosphere has, has affected us. So that, that's fundamentally where we get the improvement. All right. Uh, I'm going to pose this question to all the panelists, uh, or to any of the panelists. Any of you care to jump in? I apologize. I wasn't able to preview this to you, uh, but... Uh, it's a very relevant question. What accuracy, uh, a questioner wants to know, what accuracy do road lanes need to be mapped? And what is the status 
of accurate and of accurate road and tunnel mapping. Can can any of you answer that question? I don't know the specifications, but actually what we could do is to find potholes and such because we have the sensor on the wheel. So we are really precise on finding what is happening in the road. So we could answer to that, but for the accuracy requirements, I, I, don't, I cannot answer. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up the, uh, the webinar very shortly. I'm going to ask each of our panelists in turn for a concluding remark. Uh, and I want to remind the audience that the full content of the webinar will be made available to you following this. And Lori will tell you exactly how that happens. Uh, and we hope that you will review it at your leisure and also share it with uh, co-workers and colleagues who may be interested. Uh, now, uh, just going around the panel, uh, Andre, some closing remarks from you? I think it was a great discussion overall, definitely some good and interesting questions from the audience. So we hopefully, you know, we presented a variety of techniques for addressing integration with low cost of low cost inertials with GNSS, starting with, uh, you know, like really bare bones solution uh, that does not require any connectivity and then adding bells and whistles to it and going all the way to extending it to sort of a machine control applications. So ho hopefully that was useful for the audience and definitely appreciate your guys' interest and attention today. Thanks. How about you, Philip? A few closing words for the audience. Well, I was extremely impressed by how much, uh, what's the word, compatibility, how the, the speakers all had very common views uh, along the lines of, it's horses for courses, so if you need something that's easy to put in the car or you need something that's uh, incredibly low cost, you can go one way. If you want the, the middle zone where you just want to improve the accuracy of, of what you would have with GNSS only, or finally, if you want to, to be down at the decimeter level, you can add complexity as you go and in, in all these cases the inertial helps considerably. So I was very impressed by the way uh, all three types of application sort of merged together. Yeah well as they say great minds think alike. Uh, you see uh, some final words from you for our audience. Yeah it was great to be here and it's really I'm really glad that there's uh, interest in inertial and in the future, um, I, I really believe that MEM sensors and gyroscopes especially are getting more and more accurate. So we will, we will see lots of new stuff coming. It was great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yes, in, in words uh, spoken in the last webinar that I moderated, uh, one, one speaker ventured that the future of navigation is inertial plus. Plus what? Plus some other sensor. And as we've seen in, in this webinar, in most cases, that is GNSS, but it could be uh, something else. At any rate, uh, there's a, a, a lot out there to explore, and we, uh, we thank our panel, and we encourage uh, all of our audience to get out there and explore. I'm sure you're doing that. We know from the, uh, the interest that you expressed when you registered for the panel that you're all actively engaged in this field. And with that, I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to our expert webinar organizers. Uh, on behalf of Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems, and thanks again to you, the audience, for attending. Back to you, Lori. All right. And folks, before we sign off, yes, another thank you uh, to all of you for joining and trust that you found today to be of value. Special thanks to our distinguished panel members and, of course, our sponsor and co-host Inside GNSS, Inside Unmanned, and QNAV. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining. This is Lori Dearman saying we hope we see you on the next one. Bye for now. <laughs>